my grandfather, Harry Sr., logged on uh, 88 next to Shannon Creek. That was the first camp in Antrim County. The second camp was right straight east of the present Shannon Creek, but next to the Cedar River Golf Course. That was camp number two. Camp number three was in section nine, which we live in right now. And camp number four was at Rileyville, which was in Kearney Township in the northwest corner. Uh, my grandfather was, uh, shall we say, retired when I remember him much. I never asked him too much about the lumbering operation. At that time, I was, shall we say, not interested, I guess. My aunt that was born in the lumber camp, and I talked to her after I was say 18 or 19 years old, I was more interested in it at that time than I was when I was a kid. There was a lot, a lot of people here at the lumber, and the lumber era started in uh, the early 1860s and went through to about 1920, and the lumber was gone, and then it became agricultural. The lumbering kept going on, but it kept moving and the men went further to work than they were, and the women and the children would farm the land that they had derooted, or they worked around the roots. And that's how this whole area of Antrim got settled, in Travers, Petoskey, and all the way up to UP. My great-grandfather, William Riley, Harry Sr.'s father, moved to Nuevo, the area and he started the William R. Riley Lumber Company. My grandfather worked for him, and then he started north. And they did a, a lot of uh, logging in uh, Kalkaska County South Kalkaska, and then they moved north. My grandfather left Kalkaska about 1900 and came to Belair. The logging that was done here was all done with slaves. The main reason they logged in the wintertime is because they didn't have any work in the farm. And the logging in the wintertime was a lot easier because the cut logs would skid on the snow a lot easier than they would on the dry ground. Another thing, too, that the mill didn't like logs that were dragged in the dirt because it, uh, the saw life was very short. They'd have to stop and, and file them. And uh, in the wintertime, if it were on snow, it didn't affect the saw very much. The tree was cut, and the team would back up to the logs, and when they would hook them with a pair of tongs, then the horses would haul it to a central pile, and then after they had a pile of logs, a teamster would come with a set of sleighs, a bunk sleighs, for hauling logs, and he would pull up alongside of that, and another team would do a cross haul and roll the logs up on the sleighs, usually about four logs wide on the bottom, and then three logs, and then two logs, and then one log on top, so it was a pyramid-like. Logs were cut up on the stump about uh, oh, three feet high, because when the men were standing in the snow, they would work at waist level. 
And so when they got the tree down, when they skidded, they had to guide the log around the stumps that are laying there. And that's where they used a can hook. The can hook would roll those logs. One guy on a can hook and a log was, uh, he could put it about any place he wanted it. The main thing was an ax. The next thing was a cross-cut saw. They had a one-man saw that they used mostly for cordwood, smaller logs. Then a two-man saw for the big timber. That was mostly about five foot uh, up to uh, eight or nine foot. Every sawyer had a couple of wedges in his pocket. And uh, as soon as they got the saw in far enough, they would put a wedge in so the tree didn't come back on and pinch the saw. As they went farther, they would drive the wedge farther in so they kept the tree tight and started start to lean a little bit. Each tree was notched on the direction they wanted it to fall. And a good sawyer could uh, almost drive a nail or a stake with a tree. That was one of their contests that they used to have was to be drive a stake out there and have a tree fall down and drive it farther into the ground. And uh, a lot of sawyers could do that. There was a story around, which I heard, and uh, men tell about it. A guy got caught under one of the trees. My grandfather was there alone. He lifted that tree off of the guy, so the guy got out. He lived, and afterwards, there weren't two men that could lift that tree. I can remember him telling about that. In my Christmas tree occupation, two of the kids that worked for us knew that there was a camp there, and I understood that it was a logging camp of my grandfather's, but I was too busy, and uh, I never got around to ask them where Rileyville was. Who knew I was with the Historical Society? So he asked if there was any way I could find out where it was. So I'm thinking, well, take care of that easy enough, I'll go to the courthouse. I went to the courthouse, I found things on her, we found what Harry owned property, but we found nothing of the logging camp. And after several efforts and on, online searching, I finally went on to other things. Years later, and I'm out with the grandkids in the Mormon natural area. I'm wandering through there, but then you started seeing things. And when I grew up as a child, I was always wandering in the woods, and it had also all been logged up there in Sheboygan. And I'm realizing how similar this was to what I knew as a child. And then all of a sudden you see, okay, there's a big bank in here. There's a whole big rectangle where a building once stood, and you started picking this stuff up. And once it hit, and it all came together, it was like wham, and the flags went up, you know, and the stars, and you know, okay, now I've got it. So I went home, and I called Herb, and I said, I think I found you Rileyville. And we met, and then I was able to confirm that it, it was a logging camp, because one of the things we found was the railroad grade of the old logging camp railroads. He said, this is it, this is it. It was definitely a logging camp. Well, that gave us a section number. Now I could go back to the courthouse. And I did that and found out that, yes, it was a logging company, and it was owned by the Lake Superior Chemical Company, and that someone had hired one contracting crew to come in in 1901, and they cut off all the soft lumber, the basswood and the elm, and left the rest. And in 1905, that they had another contractor come in, which was Harry Riley, and he logged off the rest of it. And this is what we found out, and that there was a nail gauge railroad coming from the logging camps down to the shores of Intermediate Lake. 
the lumber was tugboated down the intermediate lake, the intermediate river, to Bel Air, the CC part of Sawmill. So now we had something to go by, so then it was a thing of trying to find what was where in the logging camp. And that's where we're still at, is the, the work of saying, well, this was here because you'd want a dining hall close to the water. You wouldn't want the stables up river of the dining hall, and you try and piece everything together. There's a lot of publicity out now. You've probably seen flyers. There's a big article in the uh, Antrim Review today about Rileyville. We know now where it is and at the approximate date, what we would like to do is get permission to place another stone on the left-hand side of that driveway that says Rileyville for the description of my grandfather's logging camp. That's what I'm asking for. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed say no. I didn't get it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's a yes, sir. I was, I was born in 1919, and back then they didn't have hearing like they got today. I <laughs> <don't hear. laughs> Thank you, Herb. If it was ever put back as a tourist attraction, and it would also make a great place to store history you know, artifacts. It would be in a place that people could understand, okay, I see how that was used. I'd like to see it rebuilt. I would love to see the dining hall rebuilt, the bunkhouse, and just put tools of that era back out there and show everything that used to be as a teaching aid to young people about how this whole country got settled. It didn't just happen overnight. <laughs>